there are mountains ahead that I can't move by myself but I know when I'm weak he's strong when I can barely breathe there's still a song even though it's hard right now I'm not here on my own so when it seems it can't be done God is big enough I can run the race I'm called to run Cause I know God is big enough He'll finish everything He starts He'll meet us right here where we are I can feel faith rising up Cause I know God is big Shadows of doubt make me feel small. I declare that I don't stand in my strength at all. Oh no, cause I won't live a day you didn't plan. Every single moment is in your hands. Even if the whole world shakes, you're the rock on which I stand. So when it seems it can be done. I know God is big enough. I can run the race I'm called to run. Cause I know God is big enough. He'll finish everything He starts. He'll meet us right here where we are. And I can feel faith rising up. Cause I know God is big enough. He's bigger than the fear surrounds me. He's bigger than the chains that have bound me. He's bigger than the story my past can tell. Oh, he's bigger than the weight of tomorrow. He's bigger than the hurt and the sorrow. He's bigger than the lies I've told myself. So when it seems it can't be done, God is big enough. I can run the race I'm called to run. Cause I know God is big enough. He'll finish everything He starts. He'll meet us right here where we are. And I can feel faith rising up. So when it seems it can't be done, I know God is big enough. I can run the race I'm called to run, cause I know God is big enough. He'll finish everything He starts. He'll meet us right here where we are. And I can feel faith rising up, cause I know God is big enough. Yeah, I know God is big Here we go. <laughs> Aren't you glad that he's big enough? Yes, amen. amen. Bigger than anything that I have ever faced. and Bigger than a whole lot more things that are bigger than anything that I've ever faced. He is absolutely amazing. Uh, I enjoyed the service this morning. and I think everybody else did too. It was good singing, good preaching, uh, wonderful service. I enjoyed uh, Sunday school this morning. Uh, Sunday school is downstairs. It's been great uh, every Sunday morning. We uh, dig into it, we ask questions, we uh, go back and forth and really discuss the Word of God. And uh, I think there's a, a lot of value in, in digging in and, and really 
talking about the Word of God. You know, it's one thing to, to, read, uh, to read the Word of God and, and ruminate on it and think about it a little bit and let it soak into you. But then when you begin to speak to other like-minded individuals about the Word, then some things start to click and some things start to align. And, and, and you realize maybe where one area where you're starting to figure it out, they've, in that other area where you're still fuzzy, God has given them some. Uh, some insight, and through the Spirit and through your fellowship together, things begin to, to make sense, and you find uh, what God has intended for you to find in His Word, and it's good. Uh, I recommend it. <laughs> Stay in the Word of God, and if you're not, uh, you know, coming to, to Sunday school, come to Sunday school. <laughs> so, uh, there's, there's that plug, um, but uh, we are in Daniel uh, chapter number one. Um, so far, the I had, had a good time last week uh, at the beginning part of chapter number one, and we're kind of we're kind of going to go through some of the same verses that we did last week. Uh, there was just uh, multiple points that uh, I wanted to, to pull out of this and, and to discuss, and then we'll uh, finish out the, the chapter uh, here tonight. Um, and there's, there's so much history in the book of Daniel that I felt like I had to uh, spend some time letting you know what led up to this moment last week. And so that took a little bit of time to get to. And so we only got into the very beginning of what is actually going on to Daniel and his uh, uh, three companions here uh, in, uh, in Babylon. And so uh, we'll begin reading. We'll just go ahead and read the whole chapter again so that everyone's reminded of where we're at and what's going on. And then we'll, we'll take a closer look at uh, uh, what's here in the Word of God. So in Daniel chapter number 1, Beginning at verse number one, the scripture says this. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat And of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why should he see your faces worse, likening than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat, and as thou seest, deal with thy servants." So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenances appear fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams." Now at the end of the days uh, that the king had uh, said he should bring them in, the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them, and among them all uh, was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. 
Uh, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to open up your word, Lord, to, uh, to read and to draw closer to you. Uh, Lord, as we, as we dig in once again to the, uh, the book of your prophet Daniel, God, I, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to, uh, to have understanding, that you would help us to uh, perceive what it is that you have planted into your word for us, that we might apply it to our lives and uh, apply it to, to all that we do so that we might be the light and the witness that we need to be so that we can lift you high and preach your word to this lost and fallen world so that uh, people can come to know you as their Lord and Savior, so that we can glorify you as you ought to be glorified, and so that we might spread your name as it ought to be spread. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. So we find here uh, that the scripture tells us uh, a, a little bit, verses 1 through 7, uh, about what is going on. It kind of uh, sets the scene. And we went through last week, we understood how we got here, the position that uh, uh, Israel or Judah specifically had been in over the past few years, and how, or well, more than that, really, uh, uh, over the past very long amount of time, they continued to fight against the things of God. And there had been evil king after evil king, and, and a righteous king every now and again, like Josiah, mixed in there. Uh, but then yet another evil king would come along, and, and the people continued to fight against the things of God, continued uh, to kill the prophets that would tell them uh, that they were stiff-necked people and that they needed to get back to the things of God. And over and over again, they, they uh, did uh, refuse to follow the law, refuse to, uh, to keep the Sabbath, refuse to, uh, to follow the word of God. And so uh, God, it says, you know, he had seen them uh, go through many different things, but ultimately because of their wickedness, they would be punished and they would face, uh, uh, he said that the land would be made desolate and that uh, Jerusalem would be in shambles and that they would be turned over to their enemies. And this is uh, prophesied by Isaiah, it is prophesied by Jeremiah, and it's prophesied uh, by a few other of the prophets in, uh, in the book of Kings. And we find uh, in Jeremiah 25 that Jeremiah says that their captivity in uh, Babylon, uh, Babylon would last for 70 years. So they would be taken away, taken away into captivity, that they would be enslaved uh, to the, the kingdom of the Babylonians, and that the children would be carried off to Babylon, and there they would remain for 70 years. And uh, last week, as we went through all of that, we saw uh, that that is, information is given to us in 1 Kings. It's given to us in, in, in Jeremiah uh, chapter 27, that it's given to us in uh, Second Chronicles. And I, I did make or excuse me, Second Kings, but I did make one error uh, last week as I was referring back to uh, Second Kings and uh, pointing out the uh, different times of deportation uh, to uh, of the Israelites or of those of the children of Judah to Babylon. There were three deportations over to Babylon, and there is a note uh, if you have a Schofield Bible that uh, calls out and says that the first deportation to Babylon uh, was when Jehoiachin was king of Judah and that he was taken captive at that time. That's not compatible with the book of Daniel chapter 1 where the Bible tells us that in the year, uh, third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it and then carried away Daniel and these others. And so uh, Schofield might have gotten a little bit mixed up there. And uh, in, the, in the Latin Vulgate, it refers to that also as the first deportation. So he probably carried over that footnote uh, to his writings. Um, but in fact, the first deportation happens with Jehoiakim, not Jehoiachin. Jehoiachin was his son. And so if you look up in uh, 2 Kings chapter uh, 24, verse 5, uh, the Bible tells us about Jehoiakim. And if you look over into uh, 2 Chronicles, uh, chapter 36, verse 4, we see that uh, it was during the reign of Jehoiakim that uh, the first siege against Israel came, and the, or against Judah came. And so Nebuchadnezzar comes against Judah, and the first deportation happens in the third year and the, the tenth day or excuse me, in the third year of Jehoiakim, and it continues through to his fourth year. So you'll find in the book of Jeremiah that he says the fourth year, and then in the book of Daniel, Daniel says the third year, and you say, well, why is that? Is there some sort of disagreement here in the scripture? Is, is, there, is there someone that is mistaken, or is there uh, some sort of confusion? And uh, there have been past uh, criticism saying, well, this is, uh, shows that maybe the authorship of Daniel was in, in jeopardy or in doubt. Uh, but the difference here is their point of reference. You see, one is referencing the reign of Jehoiakim with regards to the Babylonian perspective. So that was the day and the time when Nebuchadnezzar set out from Babylon and began to go siege and, and to wage war against Judah. And so it was in the third year of his reign that he headed that way. You see, in those days, you didn't just take your whole army and fly across the sea and wage war against someone. It took a while. 
It took a little while to, to get a whole army together. It took a little while to plan a siege. It took a while to go from Babylon all the way to Jerusalem. And so it began in the third year, in the tenth day of the reign of Jehoiakim. And it continued all the way through until the ninth month of his fourth year. Uh, and we find so that uh, there, there is no disagreement there between Daniel and Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah's looking at the end. Daniel's looking at the beginning. It's the same event. It just happened for a year and nine months. And, and so we find that uh, uh, it continues. And so there is this siege against uh, Judah. And that's the first deportation. Then the second deportation is in the third month and tenth day of the reign of Jehoiachin. Jehoiachin being the son of Jehoiakim. And uh, then after that uh, deportation, after he had rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, rebelled against Babylon, uh, Nebuchadnezzar carried off Jehoiachin, uh, took him off of his throne. He was 18 years old at the time. And then set up Zedekiah, his uncle, the brother of Jehoiakim, uh, up on the throne. And he was made to be king. And after he was king for uh, uh, some amount of time in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month and in the tenth day, the Bible tells us that a siege began against him because he rebelled against Babylon. And he rebelled against Babylon despite being told by Jeremiah over and over, don't rebel against Babylon. He rebels against Babylon, and we find that in, uh, at the end of his reign is the time when the walls of Judah and the walls of Jerusalem are smashed down. They're destroyed. The temple is burned. And at that moment, basically everyone from Judah is carried away. And there's no one left except for a small remnant. And that is uh, we find that uh, when the, the city is left in waste, if you look into the book of Nehemiah, that uh, he comes back to Jerusalem. He finds the city in waste. He finds the temple destroyed. And he says, I've got to put this back together. And uh, he, puts, he rebuilds the wall. And Zerubbabel rebuilds the temple. And Ezra brings back the law. And so all of these things uh, happen uh, later on. And we see them all happen in the Old Testament. And uh, the, uh, leading up to this, was the destruction that we saw that came in three different ways, or three different waves uh, from Babylon. And then the first wave is when Daniel was carried off to Babylon. And in the last verse here, we say, uh, the Bible tells us that Daniel continued even into the first year of King Cyrus. Uh, so we find that uh, Daniel, his, his deportation, his being carried off to Babylon, uh, begins in the third year of the reign, or, or excuse me, the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. This is the first year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, and he gets to see Babylon go from not being a world power to coming up, becoming a world power, living out its full life as a world power, and then being completely and totally destroyed. Uh, Dan in, within Daniel's lifetime, he sees a, 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 a world power, an absolute, just an empire built up and then brought back down. And, and many people look at this and they say, well, it, it's not possible that Daniel could have known the things that he knew. It's not possible that he could have seen the things that he saw. This was one uh, criticism that many in, the, in the, the very early times after the church started to go out and to preach, if, if you look into... Um, uh, the, the, the words and the commentary of St. Jerome, this is one of the things that he points out, is that many people argue that Daniel couldn't have possibly had all of this knowledge, that he couldn't have possibly seen all of these things, that uh, to have been carried off to uh, Babylon when he was uh, may, probably in his teens, somewhere between the ages of 10 and 18, and, and then being in Babylon for 70 years and seeing king after king and nation after nation, just uh, people come and go and come and go, and, and seeing this empire being built up and then taken back down, and then also forcing, and uh, according to the, the word that was given to him by God, the empires that would come after that, including including the Persians and the Grecians and the Romans, and then all the way on to the time of Christ. And so many say, well, it was written 200 and some years later, and he was looking back and romanticizing about uh, what could have been. And they tried to say, well, you know, this right here is, it, it doesn't, uh, you know, it, it, maybe it wasn't possible, but we can still try to fix it by making this adjustment, imagining that he was, you know, 200 years later, he did this and that. And, and I wonder, have you ever read the Bible? Do, do you know God? Like when people begin to, to say, you know, oh, it's not possible that Daniel could have known this. Oh, it's not possible that Daniel could have seen all this. Do you not know what God is capable of? Uh, Daniel had the hand of God upon him. And so there is absolutely uh, no doubt whatsoever that he was perfectly capable of living for uh, uh, about 80 some years and thriving through the, the rising of the kingdom of Babylon and the destruction of the kingdom of Babylon. It's handing over to the Persian and to the Median Empire. Over and over, Daniel saw all of these things. He was given all of this wisdom because the hand of the Lord was upon Daniel. 
Uh, we see all the great and mighty and wonderful things that God has done. And so when we look at, at what God does in the life of Daniel, it's no surprise. When we look at what God is capable of here, it should not be confusing to us in any, in any way or, or form. When Daniel lays out with great precision uh, the rising and the falling of upcoming kingdoms, and we'll see that later on in Daniel, it should not shock us. The hand of the same God who hung the stars in space, the same God who formed the planets, the same God uh, who with the words from his mouth put everything into being, and without him is nothing. His hand was upon Daniel. And so it should be no surprise to us what we see in the life of Daniel. And it should be no surprise to us what he can do in our lives. And you see, we, we look at Daniel and we think, well, yeah, you know, that was him. It was way back when. God's hand is upon you too. If you're his child, guess what? He's the same God. Uh, in the book of Malachi, the Bible says, I am the Lord, I change not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he is, there you go, Chris, he's big enough. And so, if there is any doubt about what he can do in your life, if there's any uh, doubt about uh, whether or not you can be successful in the things that God has placed before you, if there's any doubt whether you can be wise enough, if there's any doubt of whether, about, whether you can have the knowledge you need to have, any doubt whether you can be strong enough, guess what? You can't, but he can And so, through him, and we saw that, we, we talked about it in 2 Corinthians, when, when we are weak, he is strong. In our infirmity, we see his glory and his power. And so we got to be ready to embrace and understand our own infirmity, our own feebleness, and also embrace his power and understand his limitlessness and how wonderful and how great he is. And, and there's an excellent illustration of that in the book of Daniel. And we see that, that that takes shape in Daniel's faithfulness. That's something that we saw and we noted last week is that uh, Daniel is in a place and in a time and a position of exile. And we see that God's word is spread, that God's uh, uh, purpose is satisfied, that his, his purpose is achieved because Daniel is faithful in exile, because uh, Hananiah and, and, and Michelle and, and Azariah, because they are faithful in exile. You see, there will be times of your life when you are in positions that are essentially like exile. I wonder sometimes that within the ages of the church, if the church is not in a position right now that is something like exile, in a position where, uh, just like in the kingdom of Babylon, everything around us is hostile to the church. Everything around us tries to reshape, and we talked about that last week, that tries to reposition and reorient everything that points to God and has it point instead to the world. That was the first thing uh, that King Nebuchadnezzar did here when he brought over these young men, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and also many other uh, young men from the line of Judah. The first thing that he did is he renamed them. Every last one of their, their name pointed to God. Every one of them had a Hebrew word for the, for the name of God within their name. Uh, Daniel's name was God is my judge. Hananiah, God is gracious. Michelle, who is God? Azariah, God is my help. And they took those names and they said, well, no, Daniel will be Belteshazzar, the prince of Bel. That was the Babylonian high god. Uh, the Shadrach uh, will be illuminated by the sun god. Uh, Meshach, who is, not who is El, who is, uh, uh, who is God, but who is Aku, the, the moon god. And uh, Abednego was the servant of Nebo. He said, so let's point then also to another one of our gods. Everything that referenced the one true God, everything that referenced Yahweh, everything that re referenced Jehovah, and they took that and they said, let's, let's push that frame of reference over to our God. Let's change everything about them. Let's change everything about their lives. And he says here uh, that he brought to him certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom. Uh, and so he finds uh, some children, the Bible tells us here. Uh, and the word that is used in verse number four uh, for children is Yaladim. And Yaladim is a young man or a youth. And it's, it's generally understood that, uh, that, that this was someone between the ages of 10 and 18. So they were, they were old enough to be uh, referred to as a young man, old enough to, uh, to be someone that could go out and do some things. They could begin to learn. They could begin to hear the law. They could be, uh, to begin to understand a little bit. And so they were uh, to the point where they had started to do a little bit of, uh, they started to be taught some things, but they were not yet to the point where they were considered a man. 
And they were not yet to the point where they were established in the things that they needed to know, where they were established uh, in uh, the teaching of the Word of God, where they were established in the teaching of the law. And this is not by accident. You you see, uh, Nebuchadnezzar could have went in there and he could have just got everyone right away and brought them back to Babylon. But what he did is he went in first and he wanted to get the children. He wanted to get the young men. Uh, those whom he saw were wise, those who were cunning, those who were intelligent, uh, those who he saw as having minds that were plastic, that he could mold, that he could shape, that, that he could adjust, that he could begin to, uh, to try to train into the ways of the Chaldeans. He says he brought them uh, to the king's palace where they might teach them the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years. He says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put them into a sort of an apprenticeship of how to be a Babylonian. And I'm going to make them feel at home. I'm going to give them my food. I'm going to give them my drink. I'm going to give them everything that they need so that they are comfortable, uh, so that they are well taken care of, so that they are happy. And then I'm going to invite them, forget about Yahweh, and come to know Bel, and come to know Nebo. And come to know, uh, know, know Aku. Come, come, to, come to understand the ways of the Chaldeans, the science of the Chaldeans, the, uh, the astrology of the Chaldeans, the, uh, the gods of the Chaldeans. He says, I, I want you to know our tongue. I want you to, to, to speak our language. I want everything about your life to be like us. And he targets specifically the children. And he, but the Bible tells us here that Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, uh, and Azariah had purposed in their hearts that they would not defile themselves with the portion of the king's meat. They had decided that no matter what anyone else does, they would not defile themselves in the land of Babylon. They had decided that no matter how much anyone else reshapes their lives to look like a Babylonian life, they will not defile themselves in the land of Babylon. They decided that despite the name uh, that, that the prince of the eunuchs would give to them, that despite the name Nebuchadnezzar would give to them, their, their, their uh, pinpoint of reference, their entire life was shaped around Yahweh, and he would continue to be their God no matter what else happened, and that they would continue to stay focused on him, and they would not allow themselves to be changed into what the world would have them be. That they would not allow themselves to be defiled. And so they purposed in their hearts that this would not happen. We talked about last week that we need to purpose within our hearts that we will not allow the world to redefine us. That we will not allow our our, our ideas and our minds to be shaped by what the world thinks because like Daniel, God is our judge. We care more about what he thinks than what the world thinks. Like uh, Peter says, we ought to obey God rather than men. And so here we find that uh, that Daniel, that is the same point and and purpose and and, and his position in this moment. But Daniel is taking this stand when he's 14, 15, something like that. He's just a teenager. He's he's just a kid. He's decided to take this stand. And many of us who are parents, I want you to know that this world will try as hard as it can to take every reference that your child has focused on God and to focus instead on the things of the world. That the world will use every single tool at its disposal. It will use every app at its disposal uh, to take and to warp the mind of your children and tell everything that they see, everything that they read, that they look at it not from God's perspective, but from the world's perspective. That our public education system, that it will. There are some, still some good teachers out there, but there is a system as a whole that is targeted at taking God out of the minds of our children and replacing and putting the state into their minds. And, and focusing not on what thus saith the word of God, but this is what the science says. This is what uh, so-and-so says. This is what the college says. These are what uh, these folks say. And everything points, instead of uh, pointing to God, It points to the things of the world. And as that happens, little bit by little bit, it's not all at once. Suddenly we find that kids that grew up in church want to have nothing to do with it. That that kids that grew up under good preaching, what happened? They run away from it. How can that be? Because parents were not paying attention. Parents had not purposed that they would not allow the world to get in there and to warp the minds of their children. Parents were, were too busy with this, that, and the other. Parents were, uh, were, were too tired of, of having their, uh, their, their uh, child just acting like a, a, a maniac. And they said, here, just, uh, here's a phone. Scroll through that for a while. Listen, I, 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 this is going to 
probably makes some people mad. But there is absolutely no reason why anyone, why any child, much, I would say also probably any adult, uh, needs to have TikTok on their phone. And <laughs> I appreciate the amens. Thank you. <laughs> but that, I want you to know, the, there are, there's research right now that shows that the average age of a child's first exposure to pornography is 10 years old. And that has decreased every single year for the past 10 years. And why? Because we carry a computer in our pocket that every single month has a brand, new, a brand new, fresh, updated app that allows quicker, easier, simpler access to those things. And not only that, uh, but right out of the box, whether you're looking for it or not, the app will begin to put images in front of you and, and videos in front of you and things in front of you that will start to, to soften those things just a little bit. That will start to just make those things not, seem not so bad. I, I downloaded Snapchat so I could do some funny filters. And like I, I, I switched over to that thing that I don't know what it, what it was. Whatever's to the right, if you swipe to the right. Uh, and I, I don't even know. And I, I got over there and the very first thing was some sort of filth that says love is love. And, and, and it doesn't have to be a, a man and a woman. It can be whatever you want it to be. And I said, get this crap off my phone right now. Uninstall it and gone. And because what the world will do is they'll just barely push things in there like that. And take what God has defined and what God has established and redefine it. That it points at their idols, their gods, their false deities. And they'll take what points to God and they'll have it point to the world. They'll take what, uh, what, what, what points to the church and they'll have it point to the government. They'll, now they'll take what, uh, what, what points to uh, what, what is mighty and what is holy, what points to the word of God, and they'll have it point instead to science and to uh, all this knowledge and learning that the world thinks that it has and will continue to take uh, individuals and children especially further and further and further away from the things of God. Pay attention to what your kids and grandkids are looking at because they don't know. When that stuff comes up on the, on the phone, when that stuff comes up on the TV, when that stuff uh, comes up on the radio, someone has to be keeping watch. Because they're still in that position where they can't tell yet. They don't know yet. And if it comes up and it's right there and no one's saying, hey, you don't need to see that, then they'll assume that, yeah, I do need to see that. Yeah, that is okay. And all the other kids at school will be saying, yeah, of course that's okay. And their teachers at school will be saying, yeah, of course that's okay. And now I know what you're thinking. Well, but... You know, if I don't give them a brand new phone, they'll go to school and Sally sitting down beside of them will have a brand new phone. And then they'll feel embarrassed and, and they'll be hurt. Well, last week we talked about Daniel sitting down on the guy beside him eating steak while he's chewing on a carrot. Daniel was all right. Uh, she, uh, we, we saw that uh, Hananiah and Michelle and, and Azariah, they were all right. They were okay. You see, there is, I want you to know, a better way. That they were offered what appeared to be the very best. That they were offered what appeared to be absolutely top of the line. I mean, this is, this is the king's meat. This isn't, this isn't, this isn't the Olive Garden. This isn't, uh, uh, you know, uh, this isn't Cracker Barrel. This isn't something that you can get around here. This is the king's meat. This is something fancy. And so here is, I don't know, I like Olive Garden. It's pretty good. Uh, but here is the, the king's meat, the, the absolute best of the best. The finest of the finest. And they say, here it is. The absolute best you can get. And Daniel says, I know a better way. You see, there is a better way. Your child does not have to have all the things that this world wants them to have. Your child does not have to have all, this thing that the, all the things this world tells you that they need to have. You see, we get so consumed and so, and so caught up in trying to uh, craft for our children the, the, this, this perfect life. We imagine they're going to grow up to be a a doctor or a lawyer or, or, or an astronaut or an engineer or something exciting, and they're going to they're go make these, yeah, make these <laughs> right, I threw myself in there, you noticed. Uh, they're going to go uh, make these big bucks, and <laughs> I'm not there yet. They're going to go make the, uh, the, the big bucks, and they're going to put me in a nice retirement home, right? Uh, but we, we have these ideas that, uh, that, that we're just going to craft this perfect life for our children, and so often it involves where they're going to go to school, it involves where they're going to go to college. It involves where they're going to go to work. It involves how long they're going to go to school. And we, we craft all these things out perfectly. We think about how they're going to do in sports and how, what they're going to learn about this. And we, we say we're going to make sure they have the three R's, right? Reading, writing, and arithmetic. Uh, that they're going to have everything covered. We don't think about where God fits into that. We 
aren't so concerned about where his position and his place is in all of that. You see, the moment that Daniel was born, his parents said, God is his judge. The, the, the moment that, uh, uh, that Hananiah was born, his parents said, God is gracious. The moment Michelle was born, his parents said, who is Yahweh? Who is God? That's what we will name our son. The moment that Azariah was born, they said, God is going to be his help for all the days of his life. And they decided right then and there that they would teach them in the things of God. And so when it came time for them to stand up to a test, when it came time for them to have the portion of the king's meat offered to them, they purposed in their heart that they would not waver because something more important had come first. It's high time that we realize, yes, education is important, or is important, but it's not nearly as important as that they know God. We find here that, as, uh, that in the better way that is illustrated to us here by Daniel and, and Mishael and Hananiah and Azariah, that is shown very clearly to us. They tell the, the prince of the eunuchs, they say, uh, Daniel says, that uh, we will not defile ourselves with the king's meat. We will not defile ourselves with the, uh, with the king's wine. Uh, and he says to, the, uh, to the, the prince of the eunuchs, he says, prove thy servants. Give us a test. Test us, I beseech thee. Give us ten days. And let them give us pulse to eat, that is vegetables, uh, vegetables to eat and water to drink. This is all I want you to do. I I want you to give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. And the prince of the eunuchs, he says, I I don't know about this. Uh, Everybody else is getting all this fancy food. Everybody else is getting the best of the best. Everybody else is, is getting the absolute best that there is. If I don't set you up in the same way, you might not be successful. That's what we say, isn't it? We, well, well, well so and so is sending their kids here to school. So-and-so is sending their kids there to school. So-and-so is doing this and that, and they've, they've got all this big plan, just paving the way to Harvard for their little boy, and, and everything's just going to be perfect, and so I need to try to, to do all these things just right and give them the best of the best, and we skip over the things of God, and we worry about all the things of the world. That's what the prince of the eunuchs was doing. He's saying, I've got to be careful here. You guys need to be just like everybody else. You guys need to, to fit right in. Otherwise, you won't be successful. Otherwise, you won't be as fair. Otherwise, you won't be as fat. You won't look as healthy as everyone else. And Daniel says, listen to me. There is a better way. My God has made a better way. Put it to the test. Just give us 10 days. Just 10 days. And so he says uh, to, uh, uh, to the servant of the prince of the eunuchs, he says to Melzar, he says, test us. Give us ten days to eat vegetables and to drink water. It says, and then look upon our countenances and the countenances of the children that eat the portion of the king's meat, and as thou seest, deal with thy servants. He says, if it turns out that, it's, that it doesn't look okay, if it turns out that we aren't doing all right, if it turns out that we're not as healthy as we should be, then do whatever you need to do. It says, but give us ten days to prove that God is faithful. See, Daniel trusted so much in God he said, you, just, you let me eat vegetables for 10 days, and it's going to make such a dramatic difference that it'll be evident right away. I don't know about you, but I've tried a, a few different diets, things to, to bulk up, not slim down, and I never saw any results in 10 days. I, I mean, maybe you, you've tried this, that, and the other, and I, I don't know. Have you ever seen any dramatic results in 10 days? I mean, maybe, maybe some slight results, maybe a little bit of a change, and uh, you might, might just see a, a, a little bit of loss of water weight or something like that. You go on a different diet and you're, you're on it for 10 days, but you're not going to see a dramatic change. But here, Daniel, because he has faith, because he is faithful despite exile, because he trusts in the Lord with all of his heart, he says, give us 10 days. The Bible tells us that at the end of 10 days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in the flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. They were better than everybody. They were fairer than everybody. They were fatter than everybody. They looked good. And, and, the, and Melzar came down. The prince of the eunuchs came down. And he said, what are you feeding these guys? They look awesome. Uh, I mean, they're as healthy as oxes. They're, they, 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 they're, they're perfect. They're in great condition. He said, oh, those are the guys that have been munching on carrots and, uh, and legumes. Those are the guys that have just you know, been, been eating whatever I could scrounge out of the field. Uh, I, was, I was just throwing them the scraps that the, that the animals wouldn't eat. And he's saying, well, give everybody that. We see here that they put their faith to the test. They trusted in God. If it hadn't worked out, there's a good chance it would have been off with their heads. But they trusted in the Lord, and there was a better way. 
Not only were they fairer and fatter in the flesh, the Bible tells us, not only were they, uh, were they physically in better condition, the Bible goes on and it says, as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, that was three years, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them. And among them all was none found, or found none, like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. Now that was a big honor in Babylon. You imagine the size of that empire. And the king said, I want those four to be in here, part of my personal council. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. You see here, by putting God first, not only were they healthier, they were also smarter than everybody else. You see, we, we, we think we've got to put all the various things that the world says are necessary for an education uh, to, to be all right there and perfect. We want to make sure that our, uh, that our kids have these uh, educations where they're doing everything that the world says they have to be able to do. And, and it's not, there's nothing wrong with an education. Daniel here got an education. He learned the language of the Chaldeans. That's why the uh, part of the book of Daniel was written in Aramaic, which was a, uh, came from the language of the Chaldeans. Uh, and we find that, that, that Daniel learned their science. He learned their mathematics. He, he, he learned what they had to learn. But he purposed first that he would fear God. And we find this, it, 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 this isn't a surprise, this isn't anything new. The Bible tells us very clearly what it takes to receive wisdom. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter number 1, verse number 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And in Proverbs uh, uh, chapter number 2, verse number 6, For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Uh, on down in, in uh, Proverbs chapter number 9, Verse number 10, uh, the Bible says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. You see, if there's one thing that needs to be the predecessor, predecessor for everything else, I don't, I don't care what form of knowledge that it is, what form of science, what form of math, what, what, what form of literary understanding, I don't care what it is, the fear of the Lord, the knowledge of the holy, God comes first. Because it is upon that foundation and upon that reference point that everything else depends. Without that infinite reference point, nothing else makes sense. Without that infinite reference point of love, no other love makes sense. Without that uh, infinite reference point of power, no other power makes sense. Without that infinite uh, reference point of peace, no other peace makes sense. Without, without the infinite reference point that we have here of perfect understanding, our limited understanding doesn't make any sense. Everything makes sense only with perspective to God. Why is it that the world comes up with so much crazy junk? Because they don't have a perspective of God. They don't have a knowledge of the holy. You could twist things around where all sorts of things start to make a little bit of sense when you don't have fear of the Lord, when you don't have knowledge of the holy, when you're wise in your own eyes. Then everything starts to, to come together and you start to uh, make sense out of things that are senseless. You see... God must come first. God must be first. The knowledge of the Lord must be first. The fear of the Lord must be first. And then everything else falls into place. Everything else proceeds from that. We find here the Bible tells us that, uh, that they were smarter. They were ten times uh, more wise uh, than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. Now the word here for, um, <clears throat> for magicians is kartom. And it means a teller of hidden things. That's someone that has uh, some knowledge, some ability to perceive beyond, uh, to perceive the things that, is hidden, that are hidden uh, to others. Uh, the, the word here for astrologers is a shaft, uh, and, uh, or, yeah, a shaft. And uh, in the Latin Vulgate, this is translated as the Latin form of mathematician. Uh, the, these are, they were called astrologers because they would map out the heavenly bodies, uh, but in doing so, they were practicing mathematics. They would use those mathematics uh, to try to interpret things happening in the world according to the movement of the heavenly bodies. And, and so these were individuals, these, they, they, these weren't just uh, you know, charlatans, these weren't just crazy people. These were individuals who really knew something. Uh, they, these were individuals who were, uh, in the Latin Vulgate also, uh, we find that the word that is, is made magicians is translated as philosopher. Uh, 
uh, that it's someone that is able to take literary, something literary and understand the hidden meaning, uh, to take a dream and understand the hidden meaning, uh, that the astrologers, that they were able to use mathematics to try to understand things in a deeper way. And Daniel, because he put God first, had a greater understanding of math had a greater understanding of the movement of the heavenly bodies, had a greater uh, understanding uh, of philosophy, had a greater understanding of the hidden things because God gave him knowledge because he submitted himself to God first. You see, there is a better way. And because Daniel chose the better way, we find in verse 21 that Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. So for 70 years, Daniel continued to chase after the things of God continued to have a, a position of somewhat uh, a little bit of power within the kingdom of Babylon uh, from the time that he was somewhere between 10 and 18 years old. So he uh, lived to be you know, somewhere 80 or 88 years old. Uh, so he was a very old man in that time, especially to have seen everything that he saw and to experience everything that he experienced because he continued to be faithful despite exile, despite all sorts of chaos all around him, despite all sorts of pressure all around him, he continued to be faithful. And we'll find that his, that his companions, that Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they continued to be faithful. I wonder, in this day and age, and this is the same thing I think I closed with last week, but are we going to continue to be faithful? Are we going to continue to put God first? Are we going to continue uh, to, to search for and seek out the things are according to his word before we seek out the things according to this world. The knowledge of him, fear of him, that has to come first. Not only for you, but also for your children. And we have to purpose within our heart that we will protect our children from being defiled by this world because this world will poison them if we give it the chance. If we give it one opportunity, Satan would just love to twist their minds. We have to decide that we will protect them. We have to decide that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I wonder tonight, as we face what is something like exile, maybe it is exile, will we continue to be faithful? With every head bowed and every eye closed, as we play a song, I wonder, will you be faithful in exile? Will you continue to focus on the things of God despite the chaos in this world? despite the madness in this world? Will you purpose in your heart that you're going to protect your children no matter what? That you're going to ensure that the knowledge of the Lord, that the knowledge of the Holy comes first no matter what? That the fear of the Lord comes first no matter what? I wonder tonight, will you be faithful in exile? Won't you come? Just call upon the Lord to give you the courage and the strength that it takes to remain faithful. To equip you in the same way that he equipped Daniel, so that you might stand strong despite all the trials that you will indeed face. The altar is open. These have come. How about you? Will you be faithful in a faithless world? Will you put the things of God first? Won't you come?
Father God, we praise you, Lord, and we thank you. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, I thank you that despite the, the situation that we may see ourselves in in this time and in this age, despite the chaos and the madness and the, the faithlessness of this world, God, and I, I thank you, Lord, that you are always faithful, that you are always big enough. God, and I pray, Lord, that we would always put you first. They would continue to, to keep you as our reference point for everything that we would continue to put your word first, God, that as the world pushes against us and puts the pressure on us and, and tells us that that's old-fashioned and that it's dumb and that, uh, that, that we are going against the modern things, God, I pray that we would have the backbone to just to stand up and say that we would rather obey God than obey men, that we would rather follow you than this world. Lord, I pray, God, that we would have the strength and the backbone that we need to stand for you in this age. And I pray, God, that we would just continue to give you the glory that you, own, that you alone are worthy of. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Appreciate everyone coming out this evening. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to continue forward in, in Daniel. I'm, I, uh, I've bought, like, a bunch of commentaries, and I, I've, I've run into a bit of an issue because they're all arguing with each other. Uh, I've got, I, the, I had uh, yesterday and then this morning I had H.A. Uh, Ironside here, I had St. Jerome here, I had um, Adam Clark here, and uh, this other, I forget what it is, uh, something guide to the Bible that Corey had given me, and uh, all these spread out, and I look at this guy, and he disagrees with this guy, and he disagrees with this guy, uh, and then I, I thought, let me just let me just read for a minute and <laughs> focus on the Bible uh, for a little while. Then I'll see what those guys have to say. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, it's really good to, to dig into the Word of God. Uh, the Book of Daniel is going to uh, force me uh, to to be even more uh, fastidious in my in my studying and my and uh, my praying and in my uh, uh, digging into the Word. So it's it's going to be fun. Uh, we are probably going to go slowly, so uh, you know that's, that's all right. We're going to take our time. Uh, we've got 12 chapters, 12 months. There you go. <laughs> so, uh, anything else? So we've got, um, I guess, some announcements. We're continuing to celebrate uh, our anniversary, uh, nine years that God has continued to bless this church. And uh, next week, uh, January 22nd, uh, Jeremy Atkins will be here preaching and singing. Uh, next Sunday night is going to be family night, so. It's going to be an opportunity in the month of January to take a, a night off and to uh, spend some extra time with your family before you head back to work. Uh, so that's next Sunday. And then February 12th is going to be our super service. Uh, so the uh, Super Bowl is going on, but uh, we're going to come together and focus on God first <laughs> before we worry about that. Uh, and then uh, as you're on your way out, uh, let's see. Well, when you're coming to church, uh, uh, wear your favorite team's gear, represent, uh, show it off, your, your uh, jerseys. and. Uh, enjoy a spirit-filled service, and then get your tailgate to go uh, before you go enjoy the game. So uh, looking forward to that. That's on February 12th. Also, this coming Saturday, is this Saturday, right? Uh, on uh, January 21st is going to be the Blast Zone. Uh, that's at the Fairhaven Baptist Church gym uh, over right smack dab beside Sydney and Corey. Uh, so uh, drop off your, your young'uns at 5 o'clock, and they're going to... Uh, wrangle them and, and chase them around and take care of them until 7. I know Corey is pumped up and excited about it. He's, he's going to like slip back into uh, uh, the fun he had as a youth pastor for a little while. And he was a fun youth pastor. I would try to get down here to Big Bottom any time that I could because there was always something crazy and weird going on. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. Uh, but that's uh, this coming Saturday at uh, 5 p.m. at the Fairhaven Gym. And I think that's it. Any other announcements? Nope. None? All right. Chris, I'll turn it over to you. It's going to be a short meeting afterwards, correct? Sort of the, uh, just sort of the mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. Father, thank you for this wonderful message that we've been able to dig into this evening. Help us as we study in the book of Daniel that we would continue to know not only to be faithful, but to absolutely trust you completely. We thank you for what you've given us, and we just want to praise you this evening. For it's in Christ's precious name we ask these things. And all God's children said, amen. Good night.